Jake Ludington here at HP Discover, and I'm here with Ian Jagger, and the holy grail of facilities plus capacity on, on kind of a uh, pay-as-you-go basis is utility computing, or so I understand. Can you tell me how the facility as a service that HP has introduced, plus your already existing flexible capacity, helps meet that? Right. Um, not quite pay-as-you-go, pay, pay as you go, uh, because with facilities as a service, you are entering into more of a long-term agreement, uh, so the, the fee is fixed on a, on a monthly basis, whereas flexible capacity is on a pay-per-use basis. Uh, but the principle of this is that if you take the premise of both of them, which is um, cash smarts, financial smarts, in terms of uh, how you manage uh, IT and in the case of facility as a service, the facility itself, combine them together, um, you are able to forego the need to, to build a data center or to invest in actually your own IT infrastructure because you can run with the facility as a service model from the facility perspective and then populate the entire IT infrastructure from a flexible capacity perspective. And when you do that, and if you do that, that would be utility computing. And it remains to be seen if that's where the marketplace can go, but the, the premise here is, is that by marrying the two services together, that's what actually can be achieved. So break it down for me a little bit about how, that, how something like that might be structured in a hypothetical scenario. It works, um, well, you can, you can look at it from a customer perspective from both points of view of, of both services. Um, but if I try to marry uh, a use case there, uh, you could look at um, verticals that are capital hungry for themselves, for their core businesses, uh, such as uh, resource companies, oil and gas and so on and so forth, um, pharmaceutical companies, you know, where they, they need to plow available capital into uh, research and, and, and getting the drug out there, uh, which is where they make their money. They don't make their money out of investing several millions into data centers and into IT. Um, so you can take those guys as, as, as a base here and um, they would be able to still retain entire control over their IT operations uh, by working within an as a service model as opposed to having to invest in it from a cost center perspective. Now this has the advantage of um, working from the OPEX model uh, uh, with respect to cash as opposed to capital. That means it's not going on the balance sheet, which means that they're not negatively impacting the return on asset ratios on the balance sheet, uh, which makes complete financial sense to the, to the CFO. And a lot, roughly what now, 50% of CIOs are responding into CFOs. So that's not going to harm that relationship either. And so really what you've got there then is the facilities are um, kind of, I guess what you would call on a, a creative lease arrangement, if you will, um, rather, rather than uh, say one of these companies, like a, a pharmaceutical company, like you're talking about having to do a massive infrastructure build out where they build, they build a building from the ground up and they outfit it with power and they outfit it with cooling and all of those things. They're actually purchasing all of that on a, on a monthly on demand right. basis from, uh, from like an HP. Right. And in fact, the co-location industry or the host provider service industry itself built up on that premise that uh, enterprise doesn't necessarily want to build a data center, better things to do with cash, so the co-location industry grows. Uh, what you now have is, a, is, is the ability to retain control over your IT uh, if that's what you want. So there are several advantages to go into the co-location model, but if you're doing that because you want to better manage cash, well now you can retain your own control over your own IT within a data center designed for you as opposed to you fitting within a co-location um, and, uh, and, and, and pay on a, on a monthly basis, including scheduled maintenance that, that would go along with that. This runs out over five or ten year agreements with exit strategies um, on the basis of uh, completely exit and hand the keys back to us, uh, or you could renew the contract um, where you continue just to pay on a monthly basis or you could in fact buy the facility. In fact, they were first customer for facilities as a service who is in Eastern Europe, a uh, telecom company. Um, they've projected forward to the precise spot where they do buy it and, and there's an intersection point there 
uh, where the, the, the cumulative amount that they pay over a period of time um, pays them to then acquire the facility itself as opposed to the co-location model where you would just keep paying and paying and paying and paying. And so for the, for the flexible capacity piece of that, how does that, um, how does that fit in in terms of making economic sense? I mean, I understand that you aren't making a, a capital investment and you're not doing the depreciation that you would normally be doing for the, for the servers that you buy, but uh, how does that uh, help them align cash flow in, in a scenario? I mean, like pharmaceuticals, again, being a good example of where they want to dump all their capital into research right. so that they can come out the other side with an FDA-approved drug. But uh, so, so any money that's tied up in, in facilities or right. in servers or anything is not going towards right. that. The financial smarts of this is not the panacea, right? So there's got to be other operational benefits to, to doing this. Um, I think it's more of the panacea on the facility side, but you're absolutely right, not necessarily on the IT side, so why do it there? And I think some of those operational benefits, when they go hand in glove with those financial aspects, is what makes it the tipping point. Uh, so for example, with, with flexible capacity, um, and if you think about the, um, the innovation cycles of, of IT versus facilities, you know, you have several innovation cycles within one innovation cycle for, for the facility. Because you're, you're, you're not going to build a right. building every three years. Right. So uh, you, with flexible capacity, you're, you're addressing that. Uh, because you can simply change it up, change it out, and you can switch on and switch off as you need to in terms of what your own workloads are. Um, uh, for example, if you think about the pharmaceuticals and you are bringing some of that research in-house as opposed to uh, outsourcing it to research um, companies or you know, angel investments that you've made into those kind of companies. Um, and, and you have some very dense, specific work that you need to do for a period of time, then it's an ideal, uh, ideal situation. So you're not um, limiting yourself to your own resource, in other words, uh, by buying in to, to the infrastructure on a purchase basis. You, you can use it as a service, as, as, a, as it says. So the flexible capacity kind of allows you to go on, go beyond whatever your, your capital budget might have been for servers and get into the realm of, uh, so I, I needed what I planned for plus more. Now what's really interesting is that um, you can take the flexible capacity aspect of this um, and to an extent the facilities and service aspect and take it outwards towards the cloud. So if you consider flexible capacity to be, have the benefit of public cloud but in a private sense, uh, in terms of you, you're looking at the cash model of the public cloud, but the control on the private cloud aspect of it, uh, then flexible capacity uh, through Helium now reaches out into, into, the, into the public cloud environment. Um, so if you look at that now from the facilities as a service side in terms of what is my sourcing strategy for IT, you know, do I own and operate my own data center? Do I go to the cloud? Do I outsource it? Do I go to a co-location? What we're doing is, is that we're melding those, all those options into something that smooths and cocktails into what's appropriate for the customer. So it doesn't become such a stark choice anymore. And that's what's also coming down the line with, with the advantages of flexible capacity and its reach out into Helium. So it sounds to me like this is really uh, all about you get all the advantages of ownership without any of the headaches in a lot of ways. It's hard work to convey that and you know say it without having something in your cheek, but it's <laughs> actually true. I, I mean, when I was uh, launching a month ago um, facilities as a service to the analyst community, they said, come on Ian, where's the downside? Um, and we had to think hard where there was a downside which um, I'm not going to tell you unless you... <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no, but there is. Uh, it's, and as I said, I used the word panacea earlier, um, and it's, it's not a panacea. So if I think, for example, of US public sector, um, and they, they get awarded capital on a project basis. So if they're awarded that capital, there's no benefit to them of not spending that capital. All right, so, but we can help them out there because for us, that's business as usual. We design and build data centers. Yeah. The fact that we apply the financial smarts through facilities and service on top you know, is, is bonus. Uh, but So we do have the answer for the US public sector. It's just not facilities and service. So that is what we offered to the market as the, as the downside. So it's not that bad. It doesn't sound like a big downside. Right. But <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, thanks, Ian. You're welcome. Thanks a lot.